Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Rod Mears, president of the Siskiyou Land Trust, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to our 2021 annual meeting. Uh, like last year, uh, we're doing our meeting virtually uh, for reasons which have become painfully obvious to everybody. I really miss doing this in person, but uh, must once again say that uh, we look forward to actually seeing you at a more appropriate time in the future. And in addition to the pandemic, uh, this year we've had to uh, deal with the uh, increasing challenges of uh, fire and drought in Siskiyou County. Um, but none of this has prevented the Siskiyou Land Trust uh, from doing the great things that we do. Uh, during our last annual meeting, uh, we were in the process of uh, completing three conservation easements and uh, increasing our acres under uh, conservation from just over 7,000 to over 36,000. And well, that happened, uh, plus a whole lot more that uh, we're looking forward to telling you about this evening. Uh, our annual report uh, has just been created and uh, mailed out. And if you're listening to this, hopefully you've received your copy. Um, if you haven't, um, that probably means we don't have your address and uh, you can fix that by sending us an email. But in the meantime, uh, you can access it online at www.siskiyoulandtrust.org. Um, you're going to hear from a number of our board and staff members tonight, as well as some of our partners. Uh, but first, I'd like to give a brief introduction to the entire board and staff. Uh, we have a lot for you tonight, so I'm going to be brief. Uh, first, the board. Uh, Dorinda Thompson uh, joined the board in 2017 and became our vice president. Uh, she's also a member of the Land Acquisition Committee. Uh, Gareth Plank joined the board in 2019 and became chair of the Land Acquisition Committee. Uh, he's also uh, recently agreed to be our secretary. Um, David Tucker joined the board in 2016 and has, uh, served as treasurer until earlier this year. Um, and even though David stepped down as treasurer, he uh, agreed to remain on the board, thankfully. Uh, Steve Bullock is our longest serving board member, having joined uh, the board in 2014. Uh, he was uh, chair of the outreach committee for several years and is now a member of the land acquisition committee. Um, and since our last annual meeting, we've had several new additions to the board, uh, starting with Wendy Whitson, who joined us in April and has become uh, very involved with our fundraising and recruitment activities. Uh, Bruce Berlinger joined us in July and is a member of the Land Acquisition and Fundraising Committees. And our newest board member, John Whitson, uh, just joined us in October. Uh, John has a considerable background in finance and uh, in addition to joining the board, agreed to become our treasurer. Uh, so thanks, John, for that. Um, a quick note on a name I didn't just mention, uh, Stacy Smith. Uh, who after being on the board for more than 11 years and uh, being our secretary for most of that, uh, decided to step down this year. And uh, we really miss having Stacy around, uh, but uh, greatly appreciate her years of service. So thank you, Stacy. And on to the Land Trust staff, uh, beginning with uh, Kathleen Hitt, who's our conservation director and has been for uh, over 11 years, and most of that time she spent as a one person powerhouse conservation department. Uh, but beginning last year, there was uh, too much for even Kathleen to do by herself. So we had to get her some help. Um, and that meant uh, new staff, as well as people taking on some new responsibilities. Uh, so Renee Casterline, who joined us as a contractor in 2015, and became our executive director in 2017. Um, also last year, began uh, working on our conservation easement monitoring, as well as helping out with uh, baseline reports for new easements. And uh, Laura Bradley, who joined us in 2016 as an administrative assistant and uh, spent years underutilized in that role, uh, I'm happy to say has also uh, begun helping out with our, our easement monitoring and uh, baseline reports for, for new easements. Uh, more help came in the form of Ed Stanton, uh, who joined us in August of 2020 as a conservation project manager. Um, 
he had a considerable amount of experience, so he was able to hit the ground running, which is what we needed. Um, and Kim Solga, who had been an SLT volunteer for years, um, officially joined us as an employee in January and is our outreach coordinator. And last but not least, uh, this summer, uh, the Siski Land Trust had our very first intern, uh, Mandy Twitchell, who's working on her master's degree at Southern Oregon University. Uh, spent the summer uh, providing SLT with some much needed assistance in mapping. So uh, as I said, you're gonna hear from a number of these people. Um, we're going to talk about our 2021 accomplishments, our uh, vision for the future, building our organizational capacity to achieve our goals and uh, our financial picture, both uh, currently and uh, moving forward. Uh, but before I turn things over, I want to uh, quickly say thank you to everybody listening to this for everything you do uh, for the Siskiyou Land Trust, whether that is uh, providing financial support, uh, volunteering your time, uh, or whether you're one of the incredible landowners that we work with. Uh, everything you do helps make the Siskiyou Land Trust the great organization that it is. So uh, thank you. And uh, if you're new to the Land Trust and haven't had a chance to participate in any of those ways, well, uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, talk more about how you can become a part of the Siskiyou Land Trust. So uh, with that, I am going to turn things over to Renee and say thanks, everybody. Renee, you're on mute. Thanks, Rod. <laughs> And thanks so much for that introduction. I really want to welcome everyone as well. And I'm super excited tonight to talk to you about the tremendous achievements that we've had over this past year, 2020 and 2021, have been just an amazing time for Siskiyou Land Trust. In 2020, we closed some of the biggest conservation easements in the history of this organization. And now in 2021, what we do is begin the long-term part of that work. And that's the in perpetuity monitoring and stewardship of those easements to make sure that the terms of those CEs are upheld. So let me refresh you about those projects and tell you a little bit about what's happening with them now. So Bouvier Ranch is just shy of 1,600 acres. It has two and a half miles of the South Fork of the Scott River, and that's critical habitat for coho. The Thamar family is the new conservation owner there. They have been busy out um, with projects in the Homestead area and also have phase two of a project with Cal Trout to do work in stream, placing large woody debris that improves habitat and water quality, both for the fish coming up, upstream and for the communities downstream. With EFM, we closed the wildcat block at over 8,200 acres and the whiskey block at just shy of 19,000 acres. And we were all super fortunate this year that the river complex fires and the McCash fires did not burn those properties. And in this past year, EFM has been busy. They have a 12 mile fuel break that they've been working on for a couple of years now. That's behind the town of Etna. It's to protect the town, to protect the water resource for the town. They also have an in-stream project with the Scott River Watershed Council, some of who are here tonight, um, again, to improve habitat and water quality. And then our other project was Thompson Creek, a tributary to the Klamath River. The Nature Conservancy donated an easement across those 66 acres when they sold to the conservation buyers, Glenn and Tina, who are just so enthusiastic about how they can engage with and care for that land. So it's been a really neat time for us to move into the monitoring activities of strengthening our relationship with these landowners, really developing our practices for monitoring and tracking activities on these large landscapes and getting out to do the monitoring. And I hope some of you have seen those pictures out on Facebook. So the conservation easements closing has been outstanding, but that's not the only thing. Early in 2021, 
we received notification that the land trust had been selected by the Natural Resource Conservation Service for a grant award under their Regional Conservation Partnership Program. You'll hear us call that the RCPP program. And that's a really big award for our organization. Our Klamath Cascade Headwaters Farm, Fish, and Wildlife Project is going to focus on placing agricultural lands under conservation easements that have habitat and water for coho that have the potential to improve water quality and that also could be resilient in the face of drought. So when we get to work on that project in early 2022, we'll be reaching out to landowners in the Scott, Shasta, Upper Sac, and Bogus Creek headwaters. And that's really exciting and it's big for the organization and it's not all that's on our list. Our project slate now is amazing. We are also working on closing easements on two ranches in the Scott Valley and that should happen early in 2022. We're working with EFM on the final phase, the Shackleford block at over 12,000 acres to place that whole ownership under permanent protection. And that is close to 60 square miles in Western Scott Valley. And um, I got to drive it a week ago and it's just beautiful right now with the fall colors. Um, we're also now working with the state and federal Fish and Wildlife Services on projects to protect Wairika flocks, which is an end endangered endemic plant. And that project is for fee title purchase of properties. We are in the early stages of the first acquisition now, and we'll keep moving forward on that. And we also have a new partner in the conservation of working forest lands. It's in a new watershed for us, and we're really looking forward to moving ahead on phase one with them. So I'm really excited to share those achievements with you, and there's a lot that's happened. And um, what I want to do now is share with you our conservation work through a different lens. And we'll do that by playing a video of a conversation that I had with Bettina Von Hagen, who is the CEO and co-founder of Ecotrust Forest Management. And she and I talked about their projects in Western Scott Valley, the impacts they hope to make, and why it was important for them to work with a local land trust. So we'll watch that video. And when we're done, we're going to hear from Kathleen, our conservation director, and she is going to talk to us about our Headwaters vision and our audacious goals for the future. So let me get that video up and running for you. I hope you enjoy this new look on our work. We are here with Bettina Von Hagen, the co-founder of Ecotrust Forest Management, and I am happy to take the opportunity today to chat with her a little bit about the projects that we've worked together on over in the Scott River headwaters. You will have heard about them from Siskiyou Land Trust as the Whiskey and Wildcat Conservation Easements, and we're currently working on the Shackleford Conservation Easement with EFM. So I wanted to start, Bettina, by asking you to tell us a little bit about EFM's decision to come to California. These projects were the first for EFM in California and what impact you hope to make by purchasing those properties. And I think that gives you an opportunity to talk to us a little bit too about EFM's goals and management approach. Sure, thank you, Renee, and hello, everybody. Uh, so we started EFM in 2004 with the goal of really bringing a different style of forest management uh, to the region, uh, one that looks at managing forests for the whole range of products and services that forests produce. Uh, so that would be timber, carbon, biodiversity, water, uh, jobs, recreation, and so on, uh, and really provide an alternative to sort of the dichotomy that was existing at the time of sort of either you harvest or you conserve and really develop a model for working forests, which are, you know, so much, um, constitute such a large portion of the forests in the region. And so we look uh, specifically for properties that have a lot of the characteristics that Scott River Headwaters has. Uh, you know, they're properties that are, uh, not only does it matter what you have and what matters at the property scale, but also at the landscape scale. So they're properties that are surrounded by other uh, important conservation properties by wilderness, by land trust lands, 
uh, by other sort of public and private lands that are being managed for uh, the same purposes that we are, so that the work that we do can be enhanced uh, at a landscape scale by the other properties. And Scott River Headwaters is just sort of exceptional uh, in that respect. As, as you know, it's bounded uh, and adjacent to three different wilderness areas. Uh, it forms the connection uh, between the wilderness, uh, Marble Mountain, uh, Russian, and so on, and the valley bottom. Uh, it is a working forest that has been worked hard <laughs> and uh, would appreciate a, a different uh, approach. Uh, it has so much potential, as you know, um, one of the places of the highest conifer biodiversity uh, in the world, uh, so much production of um, so many streams uh, running through it, you know, 13 streams running through that, that property, 13 major streams, countless others, um, you know, such a contribution to the Scott River, such a contribution to the Klamath system, so important for salmon. Uh, you know, those were all of the really important things that drew us uh, to the area. Um, and of course, the forest itself has great capacity for much higher productivity and health and diversity um, with a uh, with an approach that really values the full range of products and services that it has. The other thing that we look for um, that we really uh, appreciated uh, in um, in this community uh, was the social ecosystem. Uh, Siskiyou Land Trust uh, being prominent among those, but also a really lovely active watershed council that we've done a lot of work with. Uh, we have come in our diligence to look as much to sort of that social fabric uh, as to the timber characteristics and ecological characteristics because we know that in order to uh, engage in restoration projects, in order to be successfully pursue conservation easements, we need partners. Uh, we need, uh, in particular, a really great land trust partner in order to pursue those. Uh, so you can have all the other stuff, but if you don't have that social ecosystem, you know, you're not going to be successful in terms of seeking funding for permanent protection and for conservation and for restoration funding. Nice. Well, thank you for sharing that, Bettina, because it has been just amazing to work with EFM. And as we've done so, I mean, you, you reached out to Siskiyou Land Trust really early um, after EFM purchased the properties there on the west side of Scott Valley. And um, it was a really neat thing for us to become a part of the project, and it's, I think, an interesting thing for folks to hear, you know, why did EFM choose to look for a local land trust? How do you feel that that locality of a land trust contributes to that social fabric that you described? Yeah, absolutely, and we did. Uh, we did seek you out, and um, we had a nice courtship. Uh, and then, of course, this this relationship that we've developed, and you know, I think we have um, most of the places where we work, we work with very local land trusts. We want to know. I mean, this, these are projects in which we put a lot of resources. Uh, we bring equity capital to bear. Um, the results are very, very important to us, and we want to know that the land trust is deeply committed to that, and that it's their number one project. Um, sometimes we'll be a number two, but generally, that it is a very high priority pro project for them. So that's part of the attraction of working with the local land trust where these, this landscape is deeply important to them and the relationships that they have are really local uh, as well. Um, Nay, I appreciated, I think when I met you, um, that you had a long background in ranching um, and a long family background in that. And I think it's important for us to, uh, you know, our values uh, at EFM is we're really deeply committed to working landscapes um, we recognize all of the benefits of conservation uh, in terms of biodiversity protection, water protection, and all the rest. We know that wood has to come from somewhere. Uh, and so, uh, you know, working, working with a land trust that understands uh, working landscapes, you know, that understands the, uh, and the benefits and the opportunities of both uh, creating jobs and opportunities for local people and developing uh, and helping to contribute to a local economy that's based on healthy forests and the flow of products and services from them is really important in terms of that conservation being enduring and also those conservation benefits being equitable and really linking the fortunes of the community to the fortunes of that healthy forest, you know, through that economic exchange, uh, you know, are a really important aspect for us as well. So we, we felt like you were a kindred spirit uh, in terms of the people, uh, you, Renee, Kathleen, Garrett, and others, uh, you know, from the SLT community, uh, we felt that we were aligned in terms of our values. Uh, so that was, I think, another another part of it. 
Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I just have to tell you, it's been delightful to be working with EFM on these projects. And we're really looking forward to the final project, Shackleford, to complete conservation easements across the entire ownership. So it's um, it's been a handful of years since EFM purchased the property. I think we're coming up on three and a half or four years. There, that's definitely been, there's some, been some challenges during that period of time. Fire has certainly been one of those, but can you take a few seconds to highlight, you know, what some of the positives um, or positive challenges have been in this period of time that EFM has owned these lands? Yeah, it's, just a, it's a, actually sort of a blink of an eye of time in terms of, um, you know, where this, the desired future condition of this forest and where it needs to go. Um, you know, I think that some of the highlights have been, um, you know, obviously the conservation easements. So, you know, reducing development pressure permanently, uh, removing development pressure from the land is number one. And as you said, uh, Shackleford will be a great project for us this coming year. Uh, the other, you know, it's we were really, really grateful uh, to receive uh, grant funding, uh, you know, from, from CAL FIRE uh, to uh, do a number of different things on the property. Of, which we would like to do much, much more. Um, thinning and fire resilience would be, would be top of the list. Um, you know, being able to continue to expand that project. Uh, you know, as you know, um, a lot of the fire originates in the wilderness, and we are the defense. Um, you know, for the valley community, of those wilderness fires, because we have the roads and the infrastructure, uh, and it's often the first place where you can actually fight the fires. Uh, so continuing to really work with the community, with CAL FIRE, with all of the agencies uh, around fire resilience um, is really top of the list uh, for us in terms of forced health. Um, you know, I, I think like you, the fires of 2020 uh, were absolutely traumatizing <laughs> and 2021 and just the increased pace of fire. And, um, you know, we have to protect these, um, these forests uh, from that type of catastrophic fire. So anyway, so, so fire resilience would be top of the list. Uh, you know, the other work we have done is replanting previously burned areas that were burned actually before, before our ownership um, and, you know, protecting water resources. Um, the work we've done uh, with the Watershed Council and others on um, uh, making a, a lot of our streams um, inviting for beaver, uh, we've been, Really thrilled to have such a great beaver education uh, in Scott Valley and uh, to think about reintroducing uh, beaver into the landscape in a meaningful way and enhancing the ability of our property to act as a sponge and increase habitat benefits uh, and all of that. So, um, uh, you know, all of that while this property continues to, while the trees continue to to grow and mature and recover, I think, from prior harvests and get into a place where they can once again begin to contribute to sort of responsible timber production uh, in the region more significantly. So all of those things. So, so I think timber production is, um, is on our mind, which is really uh, sort of creating the conditions for the forest to, uh, to get into a place where we can um, resume timber um, timber harvesting in a way that is um, contributes financially to the property, uh, contributes to the region in terms of jobs and opportunities, but does so in a way that continues to grow uh, the inventory and grow diversity and grow structural complexity, fire resilience, and then of course, all of the restoration uh, around the waterways to really enhance the flow of cold, clean water. So those, I think, are all things on our minds. Um, you know, we'd love to to think more about with the community, about other opportunities uh, around job creation. We love the biochar project. Not sure if that's the one that's going to really um, uh, be the be, in, be a strong economic engine or not. But we love to continue to explore, um, of course, methods of using um, small diameter wood uh, in ways that are productive. We know that a lot of our production will be around that as we do those restoration projects and finding opportunities uh, to create jobs and create value around those are, are also um, top of our list. So those are the some some of the things we're thinking about as we um, and planning for, you know, as we go into this next next few years of ownership. Nice. Well, thank you, Bettina. And I 
really grateful that we were able to have this conversation and to share with land trust supporters. I think it's an awesome opportunity for you all to get a sense for EFM and the work that they bring to these lands and to Siskiyou County. And it's been such a wonderful working relationship for us, a wonderful opportunity for conservation here in Siskiyou County. And Bettina, we are so grateful to be in this long relationship of partnership with you and EFM. So thank you so much for your time today. And I'm really happy that we got to do this together. Me too, Renee, and we are so grateful for you and for the Land Trust and so excited um, that you are growing and expanding and becoming, you know, the force in the region that is so much needed. Nice. Well, thank you. We are here with... Well, thank you so much, Bettina, and hello, everybody. Kathleen hit with Siskiyou Land Trust, as you know, conservation director. Um, I'm gonna take a step back from that um, project conversation to just share a bit about how we've arrived at where we're at today with conservation vision, where we're at and where we're headed. Um, sharing this evening, really our conservation vision and its evolution that, um, that brought us to projects like the ones we closed in 2020, the forest conservation easements and the ag easements that we're working on now and others. So I'll just share that after 25 years as a local nonprofit land conservation organization, we feel like we're truly stepping into our founders vision of watershed conservation and beyond. Um, today, as we meet with you virtually, we're looking at asking ourselves to conserve 100,000 acres by Siskiyou Land Trust and our partners by the year 2030. And so how, why, how did we get there? Why do we get there? And I'd really, in retrospect and reflection share, it's been an evolution. Um, as the Land Trust started, you know, as our founders just understood that the need for this place based, or the need for the land trust based on the biodiversity of this place, the source waters and headwaters that this entire region of Siskiyou County provides. They just started as best they could with an all volunteer organization for over a decade and really stepping stones is how we started. You know, we have Sis and Meadow as a major stepping stone, Hammond Pond and our first conservation easement actually over on the Trinity River were our dip into being a conservation organization that actually held property. And with these patches of lands, even with those small beginnings and a volunteer board, there was always a watershed vision. There's always been a vision of weaving together conserved lands and that those priorities were set primarily according to watershed and waterways. And as the land trust started 25 plus years ago, the lens, the aperture for where we're start, we started was a lot smaller than it is today. And so I liken this actually, I liken our evolution of our vision and our accomplishments <laughs> to taking a hike. <laughs> we start out you know, at, at lower elevations, uh, in a forest, we often have to cross large waterways, you know, cross stones, cross these waterways with our heads down, focused on getting across the river. And as we go up and, and around up a mountain, we start to gain perspective on where it is that we're, that we're at, where we're hiking at. We get to see not just the insides of the forest and the details of the moss and the plants and the streams and the birds we hear, but we start to look at that larger vision. And I'd say for the land trust, that accomplishment really landed with our anchor points of agricultural conservation easements that helped us set a place to work from and give us the vision to work towards and up those watersheds. And so as we grew over the last decade really into that larger vision of our founders, going up the mountain of a hike, we were able to set that anchor point. And once we arrived at that place, those conservation easements on agricultural lands that expanded from Plank Whipple to Spencer, Spencer's now working with fowls, 
and the Spencer family to envision a larger landscape, we were able to look up and we were able to look up at the forested mountaintops, just like when you're hiking, go, going up, up, as you reach the Alpine lakes and as you reach up onto those, those ridge points, like we were able to um, with working with EFM and our forest conservation easements, we arrived at this place of scope and scale that I don't think we knew we could get to, um, but yet we did. And so there we are, and here we are sitting on this peak, this precipice, looking out as this picture implies from Big Meadows, we we're able to not just look out and weave ribbons of corridors through riverways or habitat corridors that are essential for wildlife and birds and people, but we were able to see the connectivity of patchwork as a quilt versus these ribbons in the landscape and not only see them as a possibility, but know that, oh my gosh, we've accomplished this through the work we've done to date. Each, each project, each relationship building upon itself to that place that we build up as we make it to the precipice of a hike, looking out onto that landscape and being able to reflect and say, oh my gosh, it is not just one place in an island. We're now weaving together this patchwork. And so as we're standing on that high plateau, we've grown and the land trust community has grown with us, both in the depth and breadth of where we're at. And so today, as we ask ourselves, what next? We can't look backwards and shrink from what we know is being asked of us. We see this landscape in front of us. We see watersheds. We see whole landscapes being woven together, asking for to be conserved. And we're in the headwaters. As Bettina mentioned, as we've talked about quite a bit, the land trust really is looking up and understanding the import of living in a source water region. We are the sponge. This whole area, whether it's high up in what we typically call headwaters, or if it's in the river valleys, we are here as a, a biological diversity <laughs> hotspot, as a place of resilience for changing climate. And so we've gotten to this place of recognizing we are able to do this and actually, oh my gosh, we're being asked to do even more. So the breadth and depth of what we've accomplished is full and it's more than a hundred thousand acres. You know, that is, that's a term, that's a goal that we set for the possibilities that we know are out there and that we'd like to achieve. And I'll say why a hundred thousand acres, why now? Not just because of the accomplishments we've arrived at, but also because we understand that we have to do it now. Um, we're seeing shifts in landscape, um, we're seeing shifts in ownership, and we know as we get more and more connected with every project to these places, all of the life that is up here asking us to work in partnership. And so as we offer this up, we offer it up in a way that's consistent with um, perhaps the vision that you've heard around the world um, in our nation, in our state, uh, let's conserve 30% of the earth by 2030. And so what does that even mean for us? I'd suggest that some people might see Siskiyou County as already conserved while we have millions of acres and half of it's in public land. Yet we know as a source water region that it's not just the number of conserved acres, it's the quality, it's the connectivity of landscapes, of waterways, of, of homes. So the, the places we're conserving are, we're being asked to hold a resilient space for our community and for the communities that travel through here, whether they be avian, terrestrial, fish, human communities. And so there we are figuratively and literally at this precipice, asking ourselves to reach up and reach out um, and to really, really embrace where we're standing, where we've arrived at um, as the land trust, arriving at the understanding that 
we are in a headwaters region that has integrity and the integrity of this source water headwaters area ripples out beyond where we're at. And so we wanna just say thank you, first of all, for standing with us on this journey. And secondly, um, acknowledging that, you know, we are needing so much as we step into this phase. We understand it requires, what we're asking of our conservation vision requires staffing, it requires funding, it requires all kinds of partnerships and knowledge. And again, we trust that we're capable of achieving all of this and more. And so as we work this year to complete several um, forest conservation easement projects and agricultural project easement projects and projects that expand the scope geographically and even um, in the realm of what we focus on, conserving land for an endangered flower, continuing our work in partnership with the Trail Association for Greenways. Um, as we do this, we're recognizing that we're building capacity, not just for ourselves, but for this whole region, um, both economically um, and biologically, and really asking ourselves to be the light, um, to be, to stand in that place of possibility and vision. And we're asking you to stand with us. So just wanna say thank you so very much um, for being with us on this journey and look forward to being in touch um, more directly in the in person as we move through the world of uh, virtual reality. And with that, I'm gonna pass off this conversation to Gareth Plank, who is board member, land acquisition committee chair, um, to talk a bit more about our regional partnerships and how do we actually achieve through partnerships uh, of different kinds, the work that we do to support our conservation vision. Thank you very much, Kathleen, and welcome everybody. It's uh, each year you think you get easier at doing this, but it's still just as difficult. You wanna be there, see the faces and welcome people and greet them. So again, on behalf of the, the board, welcome to our annual meeting. What I wanna talk about this evening is the leverage and success that we have at Siskiyou Land Trust is threefold. One, your acquisition dollars go further acre versus acre than virtually anywhere else in the state. Additionally, number two, we have exceptional and dedicated staff that have consistently produced results beyond our wildest expectations. And thirdly, we have important partners such as U.S. Fish and Wildlife, California Department of Conservation, the NRCS, which is the National Resource and Conservation Services, and the WCB, California's Wildlife Conservation Board, which is an adjunct of California Fish and Wildlife, as well as such other private donors that have invested significant sums into SLTs present and future success that is just waiting to be leveraged. So my quote that I started with last year from Jonathan Birdsong, who is the Western Regional Director of NIFWIP, which is the National Fish and Wildlife Federation. I love all the acronyms here to uh, do our tongue twisters on. His quote directly, Assisi County has the most to lose and the most to gain. That is as true today as it was before, as Kathleen was pointing out about our changing world and changing landscapes in front of us. Siskiyou County possesses an array of the vast tracts of forest and their accompanying watersheds, ranches and fertile farms and broad expanses of open spaces laced with a rich diversity of flora and fauna. Need we look very far south to envision what might become of these tracts of land without for thoughtful stewardship. <clears throat> so let's look at leverage. So just very simply, you know, we're looking at different slides, somewhat out of order of how I wrote, because that's kind of the nice part about being dyslexic. But when we look at what we do, we have the opportunity to leverage. So if you look at what six homes, one home in Marin County can buy six homes in Siskiyou County. And if you were to go to the Epic Center of Silicon Valley and look at Atherton, you can buy one home, a three bedroom home in Atherton at the average price you could buy 60 homes in Siskiyou County. So when you're looking at our map and the exciting things we've done here is Renee has you know, $10 million in Siskiyou County and we can protect the headwaters of the Scott River. That's 60 square miles. And that's a 
home in one home, one person's home down south. So when we talk about leverage, a home can protect an entire watershed. It's pretty hard to conceive, but that's the opportunity we possess. So when we look at what we've done with Siskiyou County and the Whiskey Block acquisition, that's basically not even a home down south. So I think that really goes to uh, highlight what we can do as far as leveraging our dollars. So we can go back to the, the previous slide, Renee, and look at in the year 1992 to 2009, you can see we had 144 acres protected and that was with a skeletal staff. We jump up to the year 2010 to 2015, 7,400 acres. And that was with basically one full-time equivalent staff plus some. So this is an incredible organization that gets immense accomplishments with very little resources. We move up to the 2016 to 2020, 30,000 acres with just a nudge over two full-time equivalent staff members. That is phenomenal performance. So now we look out by 2023, we should be reaching 56,000 acres. And of course, when you look over and you see our goal is 100,000 acres, when you look at the success of what we have done at Siskiyou Land Trust, I think our estimate of 100,000 acres is very modest at best. And I would also remind you for the listeners that most land trusts that have, have the type of scope and reach that Siskiyou Land Trust does, they have 16 to 24 full-time employees. And that's not too little what they do. That's just the remarkable job that our board, our community, our volunteers, and our staff has accomplished and our partners in the past. So now let's look at the other part of which is our ability to leverage our partners. So we have, we can buy more acres than almost anywhere else in the state on a dollar for dollar basis. We have exceptional staff, dedicated uh, volunteers, community members, and but we also have partners that we can leverage. And because of these and our other successes, we've been asked to partner with the US Fish and Wildlife in conjunction with California Department of Fish and Wildlife to help as Kathleen mentioned, to protect the endangered Wairika flocks, and this will be through a fee title acquisition. Furthermore, WCB, which is the uh, <coughs> conservation arm of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, has not only awarded Siskiyou Land Trust numerous awards for conservation easements, but they recently awarded the Land Trust in conjunction with the Scott River Watershed Trust a significant grant to study methodologies for enhancing in stream flows to the Scott River, of which, as you know, is an important nursery for the endangered coho salmon. And of course, the NRCS has just uh, awarded us a six and a half million approximately capacity grant, which is awarded to the land trust as well. These are confirmations of what Siskiyou Land Trust can do and has done. And we look at these partners, I want you to understand that these are more than dollars. These are a testimony to the competence and expectations of Siskiyou Land Trust future success. These agencies have done their thorough respective due diligence and have elected to make a significant investment in your organization, SLT. More recently, we have seen where CAL FIRE has awarded eight projects through their forestry legacy program throughout California. And I want you to pay attention when you think of the, le the leverage here. 28,000 acres are covered under these eight projects. And of those, one was awarded to Siskiyou Land Trust for the whiskey uh, block project of which uh, Renee, Kathleen, and Bettina have been uh, discussing. And as I mentioned earlier, that total 18,000 acres, when you think of leverage and eight competitive grants, that was 65% of what Cal Fire uh, designated or awarded last year went to Siskiyou County. So I want to, the Siskiyou County Land Trust, so I want you to understand the leverage we possess with what we can do with our staff and our landscape is immense. And I'm sure if you were to look at somebody in Madison Avenue, they would probably want to add the jargon, your conservation dollars go further here, of which is really the truth. So, you know, incidentally, I will point out that we have two more projects slated for completion with CAL FIRE. And so to summarize, Siskiyou County has a landscape, Siskiyou County Land Trust has the expertise and the passion to intelligently grow our capacity to meet the pressing conservation needs. And equally important, we have the commitment and meaningful partners to ensure our success. So I thank you very much for uh, participating this evening. 
And it's with great pleasure I'd like to introduce our next virtual speaker, Al Kemp, Forestry Legacy Coordinator for CAL FIRE. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Al Clem, a CAL FIRE Forest Legacy Program Coordinator. And I've worked with a good few land trusts here for just over a year uh, since I've started in the position. And CAL FIRE Forest Legacy Program, we work for state and federally funding projects throughout the state of California, all the way up to Humboldt County. And we have several projects in Siskiyou County uh, that the Siskiyou Land Trust administers. Um, projects such as Rainbow Ridge was closed a couple of years ago, federally funded project. I do annual monitoring with them uh, on that project. I work with Renee and Kathleen on that. Uh, Whiskey Conservation Easement on EcoTrust property closed last year at the end of the year. That's 18,000 acres. So that's a significant acreage uh, for our total. And for this year, uh, Shackleford Forest ranked high on the president's priority list for federal funding fiscal year 22. And, and so we're looking forward to uh, some time in the spring hearing about uh, the funding on that. And I'll be working with the Siskiyou Land Trust on that. And so um, look forward to working with Siskiyou Land Trust in the future uh, as we continue monitoring, as we continue to uh, work on our due diligence on these open projects and, and as they bring projects forward in the future, uh, going out in the field and uh, working with them and, and looking at these projects, uh, it's been a great experience. So thank you very much. Hi folks, uh, John Whitson here. I'm the new uh, treasurer of the Land Trust and I'm gonna provide a brief uh, overview of our financial results and our financial position. Um, we've got one chart to look at here. Yep, this provides a, uh, a snapshot of our financial results over our last three fiscal years, fiscal years ending June 30th. Um, and uh, what really jumps out on the page here is just how much we've grown and um, the sort of a financial representation of how much we've accomplished these last few years. Um, fiscal 19 was quite a lean year for the land trust. We did not close any, uh, any conservation easements in that year. Um, fiscal 20, our revenues jumped up uh, substantially, $878,000. This was, um, this was really dominated by a, a very generous bequest from Thamar Werrett, which um, was a real game changer for the land trust. Um, and also we closed the Thompson Creek uh, conservation easement that year. This last year, fiscal, uh, fiscal 21, um, our total revenues exceeded a million, a million dollars, a million and $82,000. The middle columns there, they represent our revenues excluding funds that we receive uh, for stewardship funds. So those are funds we're gonna use in future years to do our uh, monitoring of our, of our stewardship activities and our conservation easements. So those funds still were, um, af after the stewardship funds, we still had $545,000 in revenue, um, which covered our expenses this last year, $453,000 uh, and left us with a $92,000 uh, kind of net operating surplus um, last year. And in fact, if you look at the last two years, um, we, um, we put in nearly a million dollars into our stewardship funds. These are funds on our balance sheet, again, to pay for future um, stewardship activities. Uh, and even after setting those funds aside, we generated a significant net operating profit um, two years running, which is a, uh, it's a really good result. So uh, going forward, um, we feel we're in a, we're in a good position. Um, you've been hearing about uh, all the conservation uh, opportunities that are out there in Siskiyou County right now. There is a lot going on. Um, we've been um, finding um, a variety of grants and funding sources to help us um, go after those opportunities and realize them. And we'll, all, we'll also be doing fundraising because we'll always need support from the community um, to do the good work uh, that we do.
But going forward, um, you know, we're working hard. We're rising up to meet meet the challenge that's represented in all this opportunity. And um, we are excited about uh, our ability to continue to have a positive impact on uh, Siskiyou County going forward. So that's our financial picture. Hey everybody, I'm Wendy Whitson, and I am just going to speak to you briefly about kind of our new approach to fundraising. Um, obviously, this big vision that uh, Kathleen, Renee, and Gareth have been talking about really requires a an adjustment to the fundraising approach we've been taking taken really since the um, the organization was founded. And to up our fundraising game, we're really trying to focus on two areas. The, um, the first is that RCPP grant that you've heard mentioned. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody got the number, but it's a $6.4 million grant that um, will be paid to us over five years. It's a big grant with big obligations though, because we're required to match every penny of that, um, that uh, grant uh, in order to purchase the uh, conservation easements on up to 5,000 acres of working family ranches. And um, a lot of that money, the match money will come from other grants and other uh, government agencies that will um, uh, be funding those easements, but we still have to raise a significant portion from our supporters. The other uh, focus of our fundraising, the area where we really need to raise some money is in our capacity. Um, we've got more easements to monitor, that requires more staff. And when we have more staff, that requires new leadership skills. Now, Renee has just done a phenomenal job for us as executive director over the past few years, but I guess one of the dangers was that she fell in love with stewardship work and um, really wants to focus on, on working in our programs. So we're actually looking for a new executive director to lead the land trust into the next era of success. We also need to add stewardship staff to look after our new easements, program staff to help with the new transactions, and fund development staff to assure that the land trust has the financial capacity to embrace all of these incredible opportunities that you've heard about. Now, the RCPP funding can pay for a small part of the new staff as it's directly related to the projects we're doing, but the greatest portion of our capacity building, the grants don't cover that, and we have to, we have to come at it from other sources. That gap between grant funding and operations has always been the place where we've looked to our supporters to help us. So how do we specifically plan to up our game and meet these fundraising challenges? Um, we're really developing and expanding our fundraising efforts to include some new, um, new approaches. And um, we've got two that I call the win-win giving options, where basically our supporters can um, uh, realize some tax savings at the same time they're giving a gift. Uh, for example, if you're 70 and a half or older, you can make a qualified charitable distribution, which is a tax-free gift from, directly from your IRA to the land trust. It's a great idea for people who want to limit their taxable income, but are required to take the minimum distributions from their retirement accounts. The other thing you can do is if you have uh, shares of appreciated stock and you don't want to pay the capital gains taxes that you would incur if you sold it, you can donate the stock uh, with zero tax consequences to yourself um, and we get the full value of it and you actually can um, deduct if you itemize the, um, the uh, face value of the stock. Now, if you're unable to financially support uh, the land trust now, there's still a really powerful way that you can make an impact for decades to come that won't cost you anything today. And that's leaving us a, a gift in your will or your trust. This not only helps the land trust build a solid foundation on which to continue our work through generations, but it, it uh, sets an example for others in our community and lets us change our outlook on what's possible. So if you're interested in any of these options, please feel free to give me a call and we can help you get them set up. So what if you're not in a position to make one of these substantial gifts? Well, it's really easy to feel like small gifts don't make a difference, but every donor counts. For some grant applications that we make, it's essential that we demonstrate a really high level of commitment from our community um, and, and support for our work. In this case, it's the sheer numbers of supporters that we have as distinct from the amount of money that they give. 
and that can have a real impact. So don't conclude that a $25 gift won't make a difference because it really does. And of course, there are many ways to support us without donating a penny by being an ambassador. You can support our work through talking with others who might not know what we do. Feel free to stop by the office and pick up extra copies of our annual report, other educational materials, so that you can talk with your friends who love Siskiyou County as much as we do. And then I, I have to continue to stress the importance of volunteers to SLT. During COVID, we were reduced to you know, just using uh, volunteers in the garden and for stewardship activities, but we're looking forward to work days and field trips and classes and events in the not too distant future. So I'll just close by reminding you that Giving Tuesday, which is our largest single fundraising effort of the year, is coming up on November 30th, which is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. And you can make your donation online starting November 16th using the link on our website or on our Facebook posts. Um, and uh, this, as I said, is our biggest fundraiser of the year, and we would really appreciate your support. But no matter what, thank you deeply for everything you, you do to make our work possible um, and all the support that you give us throughout the year. You're really the most important part. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks to everyone who presented here tonight. What I'm going to do now is um, stop sharing my screen and move on to uh, the question portion of the evening. I'm just going to take a look at what we have in chat right now and um, call on folks to speak to those things. So as Wendy was presenting and mentioning the RCPP grant, we had a question come in from Dave Peterson. And Dave's question is, how much is the offset per your presentation? And Dave, what I'm guessing that you're um, that you're asking is, you know, what what amount do we think is or we expect is not going to be covered in those matching funds? Wendy mentioned we'll go out to grants um, for a lot of that, but that there are some portion um, that won't be covered. So I am. I'm going to ask Kathleen if she can speak to that question, and I hope, Dave, that I'm um, capturing what you're looking for. Kathleen, go ahead. Sure. I'm just going to say this is broadly speaking because um, the offsets are a little different as the grant progresses, but it's between $75,000 and $100,000 that the land trust has to raise in matching funds. Some of that we may be able to raise through other project grants um, where we'll have matching funds for the purchase price, but we're looking at raise, needing to raise a pretty um, significant amount of dollars um, to make use of that full um, six, almost six and a half million dollar grant. All right, thanks Kathleen. I'm uh, just replying to um, Dave because he has another question. And while I'm waiting to hear back, um, I have a question from Linda Roddy. And Linda, I've heard this one um, through the grapevine, but uh, what is the possibility of having virtual monthly slideshows? And um, one of the things that I wanna say about that is that you will have noticed as we've gone to a winter webinar series, our content has shifted. Uh, we've done more educational material that's quite different than um, the type of slideshows we presented when we were doing them in person. And a lot of that was seeing terrific photos from people traveling to really amazing places and hearing about those landscapes. We're lining up our winter webinar series now. And in fact, it starts next week on the 17th. Kim can put the details in the chat in case I don't remember them correctly. But um, we are continuing on that, that educational um, direction with our, with our webinar and really um, letting people know about projects that are happening in the community. So next week, when we kick off that winter webinar series, uh, we'll do that with the women from the SAC Source to See presentation that you saw last year when they talked about their trip before it had occurred. Now we're gonna um, hear from them after their trip had occurred and they really spent time paddling from here in Mount Shasta um, all the way to the sea via the Sacramento River. And as they did that, they were really looking at the various stakeholders along the river and, um, and the pressures on the river. And so we'll continue along those lines. We, um, 
are going to hear from the Mount Shasta Forest Service and the climbing uh, rangers and, and potentially other staff who will talk about Mount Shasta this year and all of the things that happened on the mountain, you know, talking about the fire, talking about the lahars, the flooding that's happening. So that's another informational piece that we'll do. And um, in December, we have a super fun educational opportunity. Uh, we'll be doing a webinar with John Muir Laws who is an amazing conservation artist. I have one of his guidebooks um, about the Sierra. He does um, tremendous artwork to demonstrate um, sort of the entire community in a geographic area. So we'll continue with those um, educational pieces, but Linda, uh, if Mike is with you, Mike, uh, Mike Hupp has presented for us um, at our in-person slideshows a number of times. And if you have an idea, we're happy to hear it. Let me check the chat. All right, and um, Dave, what I see here is that Kathleen had commented to you that um, she's happy to talk offline with you to share more about the RCPP program. And um, because I'm not clear on what you're asking, that's probably a good way for us to follow up on that. And um, I'm keeping an eye out for any other questions. And I don't see more popping up in the chat. So I want to take a moment to um, make use of this time and direct one question to um, a couple of individuals with us here, um, actually several individuals with us here who you um, possibly haven't met in this time of COVID. So uh, we have Ed Stanton with us who uh, came on to the Land Trust in August of 2020 and made a big splash right away. The question that I'm gonna put to Ed, I'm also gonna put to our new board members so that you'll get a chance um, to, to have a sense of connection with them as well. So Ed, the question is, how, you know, what brought you to Siskiyou County and Siskiyou Land Trust? That's a great question. Yeah. Um... You know, it really takes me back to early in my career um, when I started doing land transactions with some large organizations that work statewide or, or nationally or even internationally. And um, I always felt like we were, we were doing these transactions and raising the, these investment funds projects to, and then creating these jobs in places like San Francisco to take care of properties that are perhaps in like San, in Siskiyou County. And I always felt like there was a, a flaw on that model and that there was no reason that these small local land trusts could not be doing these transactions that we were doing from San Francisco. And so I, I sort of made it my mission that I was gonna work for a local land trust and help them build the capacity to do this work and keep those jobs and those dollars local. And so it was about 10 years ago that I started badgering Kathleen about helping me create a job for myself at Siskiyou Land Trust so that we could create more jobs and keep this money local. And here we are, creating jobs for, for really high quality uh, professional natural resource uh, managers. And, uh, and I, I, I look forward to ending my career here with Siskiyou Land Trust. Nice, thanks, Ed. And it has been a delight to work with Ed and a delight to have this capacity increase. And we are looking forward to more of that. So I wanna move on and ask the same question to our new board members. And um, there are three of you and you all should know who you are. And um, Wendy, I think I'm gonna start with you. Talk to us a little bit about what brought you to Siskiyou County and what brought you to Siskiyou Land Trust. A mute there. Um, well, let's see. So um, I and my husband and I, who is in another chat window, um, uh, we have um, been connected to Siskiyou County for uh, decades, have enjoyed uh, spending time here um, longer and longer um, each year, and um, have always hoped and wished that when we retired, we would be able to live here full time. And um, we were lucky enough to be able to do that in March of 2020. And um, it was really probably only a matter of weeks before I, I think um, I got involved with the land trust. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I was very active in, um, have been active in volunteer activities all my life and have spent um, a, a lot of time on boards. And to be able, I, I know the value of being able to connect with my community and really make a difference. I know how it changes how I feel, it changes the community and it changes how um, the kind of relationships that I build. And so it was a no brainer for me to, to be doing volunteer work and um, really uh, you know, fell into working with the land trust right away. Our passion for the open spaces, our love of the outdoors and really the incredible work that gets done here. Yeah, we, you know, the, the board members all put in a lot of time and we we try to share the burden with the staff, um, but the um, the uh, the benefit and what we achieve from doing that is so satisfying and um, it really is really just incredible. So I, I feel very lucky to be involved and um, obviously very fortunate to be living here uh, full time now to call it my home. Thanks, Wendy. We feel very fortunate to have you here with us. And now, Bruce, I'm going to bring that same question to you. What brought you to Siskiyou County and what brought you to Siskiyou Land Trust? 38 years ago, I moved to San Francisco and I said I died and went to heaven. Um, and 20 years ago, I was able to buy uh, my first house up in Siskiyou County in McLeod. And I then found out really what heaven is. And so for the last two decades, I've been going back and forth between McLeod and the Bay Area, I'm doing two full-time jobs, and I'm phasing out my Bay Area full-time job to be up in Siskiyou full-time. And like Wendy said, being part of the community and volunteering all my life on different organizations has been key to my existence. And I love making a difference. And I've been involved on many boards before just to be a voice of reason. When I found this board, it's an incredible voice of reason already. And, and just uh, so thankful to be part of a, a great group. And like Wendy said, making a difference is key. So um, I, I look forward to doing many years with the, the Cisco Land Trust. All right, thanks, Bruce. And now John Whitson, our newest board member, same question to you. Yeah, thanks, Renee. Um, you know, so uh, I started coming to Siskiyou County when I was maybe six or seven years old on, on fishing trips to Dunsmuir with my dad and my uncle. And um, so the family has a um, long ties coming up here. And um, that continued uh, over the years, you know, climbed the mountain in my uh, early 30s. And, um, you know, Wendy and I got married and started having kids and we'd bring them up here every year, uh, especially at wintertime and um, just fell in love with the place. So um, it uh, we started dreaming of retiring here uh, a number of years ago, and we were able to see that through, uh, like Wendy said, and, um, you know, move here full time um, during uh, March of 2020. Um, you know, I had a, um, I worked in finance for many years, mostly in the wine business, but I've always loved uh, environmental issues and conservation issues. And I'm a big lover of mountains and rivers and streams and watersheds. And um, so the work that the Land Trust is doing was a, a natural place for me to um, be able to contribute uh, my experience and some of my energy um, to um, to help the the great work that the land trust is doing. So um, super happy to be here, and um, yeah, it's great. All right, thanks, John. Yeah, yeah, I see. You know, some applause there. We have such a great group of people, and I'm looking at our list of attendees, and you're all still here with us. And I really want to say to you that your support matters so much as we grow into this work that we're doing and we grow into this spectacular vision of what we can achieve here in Siskiyou County and what we can do to keep these open places open and to protect the biodiversity that we have here and the water that we have here and to really look at how can we care for the land so that as um, you know, resiliency issues come up and climate change takes effect even more, we feel like we're protecting places that have a chance. And it's really important for us that you are a part of that with us. So we're happy to have been able to share with you tonight. 
what we're what we've been working on, what we're working on now. And we do all really look forward to getting together with you again when that is possible. And in the meantime, I want to say thanks for being here. Reach out if you've got any questions about any of the things that we talked about here this evening. And thanks so much for being a part of Siski Land Trust. Good night. <laughs>